So as the title indicates, I'll be telling you today about algebras and entropies for black holes and Zeta space. So I'll start with a general introduction on black holes and thermodynamics. Then I'll talk about a recent paper that's indicated and work in progress with Chandrasekharan and Pennington. And since, because of the time, I'll just try to give an overall picture rather than technical details. So as many of you know, black hole entropy goes back to the work of Jacob Bekenstein half a century ago, who was inspired by questions from John Wheeler and asked what the second law of thermodynamics means in the presence of a black hole. So for an ordinary system, the second law says the entropy can only increase. But if you throw a cup of tea into a black hole, the entropy seems to disappear. So Bekenstein wanted to generalize the concept of entropy, so the second law would hold even in the presence of a black hole. So for this, he wanted to assign an entropy to the black hole. He proposed that the area of the black hole horizon is a contribution to the entropy. I should say, so entropy always increases, so Bakensine wanted a property of the black hole that always increases. Your first thought might have been the black hole mass, but it's not true that the black hole mass always increases. For example, a spinning black hole, you can make its spin slow down if you toss in something with negative angular momentum around the axis of spin, and then the black hole can actually lose mass. This was known at the time. But Hawking had just recently proved the black hole area theorem, saying that the area of the horizon always increases. So it was known that classic, well, the area of the horizon was the quantity that classically was known to increase. So it was fairly natural for Bekenstein to propose that this should be regarded as a contribution to the entropy. So then Bekenstein defined the generalized entropy of the black hole. The generalized entropy is the area over four GH bar plus the entropy outside the black hole. The 4GH bar is needed for dimensional reasons. Entropy is dimensionless, area is not. So Bekenstein needed a constant with dimensions of area. And from GH bar in C, there is a unique one. I set C to one, so the formula is A over 4GH bar. So this term was meant to be the entropy of the horizon. And this was meant to be the ordinary entropy of matter and radiation outside the black hole. And then the generalized second law was supposed to say that the generalized entropy always increases. And Bekenstein tested it in a number of interesting ways, but some of his thought experiments actually ran into trouble, which in hindsight happened because he didn't understand that black holes radiate at long wavelengths. So in the part of Bekenstein's paper where we considered a black hole interacting with radiation of long wavelengths, he actually didn't really get a sensible answer. Stephen Hawking supposedly was skeptical of Bekenstein's idea and set out to disprove it by studying a quantum field interacting with a black hole. And here I've drawn the Penrose diagram for that situation, where the red is the trajectory of the star that collapsed to form a black hole. And over here is the horizon and so on, future infinity, past infinity. Anyway, Hawking, instead of disproving Bekenstein, ended up proving Bekenstein was right by finding that at the quantum level, a black hole is not really black, but has a temperature of order h bar. And then from, once he knew the temperature as a function of the mass or energy, from dE equals T dS, he solved for the entropy and found he recovered Bekenstein's answer. Once Hawking had computed the temperature, he, he confirmed that the entropy is a multiple of A over four g h bar. And I should say that Hawking thereby determined the constant, which is one quarter, which had been unclear in Bekenstein's work. <clears throat> so not long after Hawking's discovery, Gibbons and Hawking considered another situation with horizons, cosmology rather than black hole physics, and proposed that also the area of a cosmological horizon is a kind of entropy. More specifically, they assigned the temperature and an entropy to the region of the sitter space accessible to an observer. So the sitter space may be a good approximation to our universe in about 10 to the 11 years. It's the maximally symmetric solution of Einstein's equations with a positive cosmological constant. So it expands exponentially when T is large and positive or large and negative. Because of this exponential expansion, 
in the real world, galaxies that aren't gravitationally bound to the Milky Way will be out of sight within roughly 10 to the 11 years. They'll be behind the cosmological horizon. So here's a Pen Penrose diagram for the sitter space. So time runs vertically, space runs horizontally. And I've chosen an example where the world line of the observer is the left edge of the diagram. Shown in green is the region causally accessible to the observer, the region that the observer can influence by sending a signal and also can observe. The region causally accessible to the observer is bounded by a future horizon over here and a past horizon back here. Somewhat similarly to the picture for an eternal black hole. Gibbons and Hawking attributed to the cosmological horizon an entropy for which they use the same formula as in the case of the black hole and a corresponding temperature. The temperature, but not the entropy had actually been defined earlier. The meaning of the de Sitter entropy has been something of a mystery ever since. Now, many researchers have thought that somehow the entropy A over 4G means that the black hole or the cosmological horizon can be described by some sort of degrees of freedom that live at its surface with one bit or qubit for every 4G of area. So for example, John Wheeler in 1992 wrote a famous article where he drew this picture, which is meant to illustrate the black hole horizon with its surface drawn in little cells of area 4G, each of which is supposed to contain a bit or qubit. As I say, the article was written in 1992, but I tend to believe that Wheeler, who had been Beckenstein's advisor, had been drawing this picture for more or less 20 years. Now, more modern understanding of black hole entropy involves understanding at a more fundamental level what entropy means in quantum mechanics. So classically, you could consider n particles in a box with positions x and momentum p. A classical physicist, Boltzmann was a classical physicist. He assumed that at a given time, x and p have definite values, even if we don't know them. And so he described the state of our knowledge by a probability distribution function, rho of p and x, that encodes what we know. And after great labor at Boltzmann and his successor Gibbs defined the entropy as the phase space integral of minus rho log rho. I think this version of the formula is actually due to Gibbs. And interestingly, for dimensional reasons, there's an overall ill-defined additive constant in this formula. <clears throat> well, the quantum analog of the probability distribution function rho is the density matrix of a quantum system. So the quantum version of the Gibbs formula for entropy is the von Neumann entropy of the density matrix, the trace of minus rho log rho, which goes over to the classical formula in the classical limit and defines the additive constant that's poorly defined classically. But there's a basic difference between the classical case and the quantum case. Classically, one believes X and P have definite values and one uses a probability distribution function rho because you don't know what they are. So the entropy too reflects lack of knowledge. Quantum mechanically, you may have a lack of knowledge, but that's not the only reason for having a non-trivial entropy. If a system is entangled with something else, then a mixed state density matrix rho is the most precise description that quantum mechanics allows. And therefore there's an irreducible entropy, the entropy of this density matrix, <clears throat> even if you know the state of the system as precisely as possible. There's no classical analog for this. Well, the reason I've mentioned this is that <clears throat> it was proposed, well, a decade after Beckenstein by Sorkin originally, that black hole entropy should be understood in terms of this entanglement entropy, as it's called, the irreducible quantum entropy that remains when you know the state of a system as precisely as possible. Not sure what I did to lose my place, but let's find it again. So Sorkin's idea was the following. In a quantum field theory, divide space into two regions A and B. Now, Sorkin was interested in the case that B was the region behind the black hole horizon, 
and A was the exterior of the horizon. But I'll be making some remarks that are, are general. They don't depend on that interpretation of the picture. So let psi be a state of the system, but imagine you're a physicist who only has access to region A. Then even if the whole world is in a pure state, you would have to use a mixed state density matrix rho A that describes measurement in the state psi in the region A. Then you can try to calculate the entropy of this density matrix minus trace of rho A log rho A. Well, Sorkin showed that it's ultraviolet divergent regardless of psi, and the coefficient of the leading divergence is proportional to the area A of the boundary between regions A and B. So in modern language, Sorkin's idea was that somehow gravity cuts off the ultraviolet divergence, leaving an entanglement entropy in the vacuum between the two regions. That's the beckenstein hawking entropy A over 4G, where A is the area of the boundary between them. That makes a lot of intuitive sense because it matches two ideas. One is that A over 4G is supposed to be the irreducible entropy the system has for someone who can only see the region outside the horizon. Two, the divergence in the entanglement entropy that Sorkin found is proportional to A because it comes from short wavelength modes near the horizon. As if after cutting off the divergence, the density of quantum degrees of freedom on the horizon pre-unit area is 4G, as in Wheeler's picture. So that was the state of the art in 1983. And there was an important paper a couple of years later by Sorkin, Lee, Cole, and um, sorry, I believe I'm forgetting a fourth author who significantly extended the picture and did more precise calculations. The next milestone I'll mention was by Susskind and Uglin in the following decade. They made a simple but fundamental observation that strongly supported the idea that we should interpret what for Beckenstein was the entropy outside of the black hole, S out, as entanglement entropy. Sorkin, Susskind and Uglum observed that if that's what's meant by S out, then the generalized entropy defined by Beckenstein has the property that the sum is better defined than either term is separately. So the second term has an ultraviolet divergence that Sorkin had noted. But as Susskind and Uglin pointed out, the first term is also ultraviolet divergence because there's an ultraviolet divergence in the relation between the bare Newton constant G naught and the physical observed Newton constant G. When Hawking had calculated the Hawking temperature and the Hawking radiation from a black hole, he was working with the bare Newton constant. But when you talk about black hole entropy in the real world, you're talking about the physical Newton constant. And there's a renormalization between them, which is actually ultraviolet divergence. And in the one loop approximation, it looks like this. So lambda is an ultraviolet cutoff, C is a constant. At one loop order, C is independent of H bar, like the outside entropy. And Susskind and Uglum argued that the ultraviolet divergence in S out cancels that in the area term and showed that that was true in leading order. And these arguments have been refined later, so this result is accepted. So the upshot is that the generalized entropy is much better defined than either term is separately. The two terms are separately ill-defined, but the sum is well-defined. Now, 21st century developments have strongly supported this interpretation, though there are lots of mysteries that remain. And in the available time, I'm going to talk about just one aspect of the story. So why is it that entanglement entropy is ill-defined in quantum field theory, so that S out has that quadratic divergence that Sorkin pointed out, but well-defined once gravity is included? First of all, in ordinary quantum mechanics, when you consider the entanglement between two systems, A and B, you normally assume at the start that each system has its own Hilbert space, H A or H B. Then the combined system, has a tensor product Hilbert space. A state in the uh, combined Hilbert space might be a simple tensor product of states psi A and psi B. 
In that case, the systems A and B separately can be described by pure states, namely psi A and psi B, and there's no entanglement entropy. But a more typical state has a more complicated decomposition as a sum of tensor products of states of the two systems. In that case, we say that system A and B are entangled, and that's the situation in which system A has a density matrix of rank bigger than one, and correspondingly, a positive von Neumann entropy given by this formula. It comes out to be minus the sum of PI log PI. The point of this is that in ordinary quantum mechanics, whether or not a state has non-zero entanglement and entanglement entropy is a property of the state. That's not so for entanglement entropy between different regions in quantum field theory. So in Sorkin's picture, as I told you, he found an ultraviolet divergence in the entanglement entropy, but this ultraviolet divergence does not depend on the state. Every state looks like the vacuum at short distances. So the leading ultraviolet divergence in the entanglement entropy is the same for all states. So the divergent part of the entanglement entropy is more fundamental than something that's just a property of the state. The root of the problem is that it's not true that the sep there are separate Hilbert spaces HA and HB for the inside and outside regions. There's only one combined Hilbert space H of the whole system. But the separate regions A and B have are not Hilbert spaces HA and HB, but only algebras of observables, curly A and curly B. These algebras act on H, so they can be defined to be von Neumann algebras, which is just a fancy way to talk about an algebra of operators that act on a Hilbert space. <clears throat> But they're von Neumann algebras of an unfamiliar type, which accounts for the universal divergence in the entanglement entropy. There, there are three types of von Neumann algebra. The, the familiar algebra is the type one algebra of all operators on the Hilbert space. So in ordinary quantum mechanics, when we discuss a system A, it has a Hilbert space HA. And uh, at least in principle, we imagine that all or maybe all self-adjoint or all bounded self-adjoint operators, but in some sense, all operators on this Hilbert space are potentially observables. So the natural algebra is the algebra of all operators on this Hilbert space. And that's an algebra of type one. If a system is described by type one algebra A, then the system can have quantum mechanical pure states namely states in the Hilbert space on which A is the algebra of observables. You can also define density matrices and entropies for a system that has such an algebra. Now, the other types of algebra are less familiar. So a type two algebra doesn't have pure states, but it does have density matrices and entropies. A type three algebra is the worst type. A system whose observables form a type three algebra does not have pure states and also does not have density matrices or entropies. Well, by now you might anticipate the bad news. In quantum field theory, the algebra of observables of a region of space time is always of type three. So a region has observables, but to a region you can never associate a pure state or a density matrix or entropy. The type three nature of the algebra is the reason in quotes for the universal ultraviolet divergence of the entanglement entropy. However, it turns out that including gravity in a semi-classical way changes the picture at least in the case of the black hole or de Sitter space, including gravity semi-classically, changes the algebra of the region outside the horizon from type three to type two. I don't know what would happen if you could include gravity exactly. I also don't know for sure if there's a similar story for an arbitrary space-time with horizons. At the moment, this is really just a story for the black hole and de Sitter space. <clears throat> 
So when gravity is turned on semi-classically, the region outside the black hole or the distant horizon is described by an algebra in which the notion of entropy is well-defined, though there's no notion of a quantum mechanical microstate. We can interpret this as a somewhat abstract answer to the question of why including gravity suddenly enabled us to convert the ill-defined divergent S out into the better defined generalized entropy. So when we included gravity, the algebra became type two, so entropy became better defined. But to understand how this works, we need to understand something about these von Neumann algebras of type two and type three. They can be most simply described as the algebras that act on certain thermal systems. So let me explain that. <clears throat> if you have a finite thermal system with A, with Hamiltonian H and temperature or inverse temperature beta, it has a density matrix given by the usual formula, where Z is a constant such that the trace of rho is one. Roughly speaking, the thermal field double is a pure state of a larger system that has this density matrix. But that description isn't so precise in the limit of an infinite system. In the case of a finite system, we simply introduce a second copy B of the original system with an identical Hamiltonian. And then if the eigenstates of H are psi i with energies E i, the thermal field double state is defined by this simple formula. The point of the formula is that this thermal field double state is a purification of the thermal density matrix rho beta, since if you have any operator A on system A, to compute its expectation value in the thermal field double state, well, since A only acts on A and not on B, you could sum over the unobserved states of system B, and that would reduce this expectation value to the trace of A times the density matrix. And the density matrix you get, these coefficients were simply chosen, so the density matrix you get is a thermal one. Now, normally for an infinite system, this formula isn't really well-defined because Z is infinite and the sum would have uncountably many terms typically and doesn't converge. But it turns out that the state psi TFD and the whole Hilbert space of excitation around it that you get by acting with operators of the one of system A on the state psi TFD does, in, does exist and has a thermodynamic limit. So you can capture the thermodynamics of the infinite system in a Hilbert space in which the starting point is the postulate that there is a state psi that satisfies this condition. You see, the thermal expectation values have, even though this formula doesn't have a thermodynamic limit, the thermal expectation values um, do have a thermodynamic limit. And so you can somewhat abstractly characterize a state by saying that for every operator A on little a on system big A, this is true. And then also using the commutation relations of the operators of system A, you can deduce a whole, a whole Hilbert space and representation of the algebra. So, so you can make sense of the thermal field double state, but funny things happen in the thermodynamic limit. And that's where algebras of type two and type three come in. Well, let me explain how this works for the simplest case of all, which is the case that the Hamiltonian is zero. That's one Hamiltonian that we know how to diagonalize. So <clears throat> I've written the thermal field double state for a system of n qubits with the Hamiltonian being zero. It's simply a completely entangled state of system A of n qubits with a second state of system B that also consists of n qubits. So the state is the tensor product of all n, then for each n you have a sum of one of the two states of system A tensored with the corresponding state of system B, and for normalization you divide by a factor of the square root of two for each qubit. So this formula defines the thermal field double state for a finite system of qubits for the case that the Hamiltonian is zero. Well, let A and B be operators that act only on the first k spins or qubits of system A for some k that's no bigger than n. 
And to find a function f of a, which is just the thermal, well, the thermal expectation value, but for this case, we're at the Hamiltonian to zero. So it's the expectation value of a in this state. <clears throat> well, I normalize the state, so f of one is one, but crucially, f of a, b is f of b, a. Let me see if I can explain that. Um, well, the rough idea is that we're taking the expectation value of a in this state psi. Well, the state psi for each qubit Well, because of the way we've doubled the Hilbert space, A is, uh, you could think in the double Hilbert space, you could think of psi as representing the identity matrix. And then if you do think of it that way, you'll find that psi A psi becomes the trace of the identity matrix times A times the identity matrix, which is just the trace of A regarded as an operator on the one-sided Hilbert space of system capital A. I'm not sure if that explanation is clear. But whether it was clear or not, uh, it's an elementary calculation to check that with this state and f of a being the expectation value in that state, you have f of a b equals f of b a. Moreover, this function f of a has a system thermodynamic limit because f of a is independent of n as long as n is no less than k. So if I have an operator that acts on, the for, on k qubits, this formula makes sense as long as I include in the definition of psi all the qubits that A acts on. But any extra qubits are immaterial because the state was normalized and F, A doesn't act on them. <clears throat> so F of A has a thermodynamic limit. It's uh, also yes, go ahead. So uh, the uh, operators in A and operators in B, A and B, they, don't they commute or? Like this, so we... my notation may be bad. Maybe I should have called it A and A prime. So A and B act on system A. Okay. So perhaps I should have called it A and A prime, and that would have been less confusing. Okay. And then F of A A prime is F of A prime. A. Thank you for asking me because probably my notation was confusing. I may have confused. This relation is always true. Is it's irrelevant of whether A B commute or A A prime commute. A and B do A and A prime do not commute. Okay. It's crucial. A and A prime do not commute. The relation f of a b equals f of b a is not because a and b commute. Okay. It's because the Hamiltonian was zero. Thank so you. a and b act on the same system and they do not commute. But even though they don't commute, a and b are completely general operators. For example, you could have a equals sigma x and b equals sigma y or whatever. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, a and B are completely general operators. They don't commute at all. But in the particular state we defined, it is true that F of A, B equals F of B, A. Remember that the combined system had this Hilbert space H, A tensor H, B. A and, a and B don't commute, but they act only on the first factor. So the reason for this relation is not that A and B commute, but they only act on the first factor and the Hamiltonian was zero. So the state had the state had a special property that makes this true, even though the operators don't commute. Is that clear? Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay. I think I caused massive confusion with my notation, though. Uh, I hope to remember if I give this talk again to replace B by A prime. Uh, sir, I have a question. Sir. Yes, go ahead. Yes, but in the expression of psi, we have defined, uh, we have said that each nth qubit is uh, entangled to nth qubit in the second. But uh, even if I'm not getting wrong, if uh, you are writing it as a product state, right? Sum of product states. Every state uh, for... is a product state. I wrote it yeah. as a sum of product states, but every state can be so written. Hello? Okay. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. so how how uh, we can see from this equation that uh, 
uh, nth qubit of the first system is completely entangled with nth qubit of the second. Uh, how do we see that? We should see that from this formula. This formula describes, this is a wave function just for the nth qubit of the, the n means this is for the nth qubit of the first system and the nth qubit of the second. And this formula defines a completely entangled state of two qubits. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, got it, so got it. Okay. So the formula in parentheses is a completely entangled state of one qubit here of A with one qubit of B. But then we take the tensor product. So each of the n qubits of A is completely entangled with the corresponding qubit of B. And this formula, where I use the unfortunate notation A and B, this formula has to do with the com completely entangled nature of the state. The operators A and B don't at all commute, but nevertheless, they obey this relation for that particular state because of the complete entanglement. Okay, sir. thank you. Any other questions? There's a question in the chat, uh, but but for later, uh, we can, you can proceed. Well, let, let me look at it, the question. Okay, I think we'll leave that question for later. Okay, so far we've defined F on the algebra A naught of all operators that act on only finitely many qubits of system A. When the, in the limit of an infinite system, we want to enlarge this slightly we allow certain operators to act on any number of qubits, but with matrix elements that decay when the number of qubits is large. And then in that way, we complete A0 to a line one algebra A, which still has a function F of A that obeys all the properties I've stated. The most important property is that F of AB equals F of BA. And therefore, this function is usually called a trace. So I'll write it as a trace. I'll write f of a as trace a. But trace a is not the trace of a in any Hilbert space representation. It's more like a renormalized trace with an infinite factor removed. Well, there's a more elementary example that you all know of an infinite dimensional algebra with a trace, the type one algebra of all operators on an infinite dimensional Hilbert space curly H. In this example, while we can define a trace, it's not defined for all elements of the algebra, only for those that are trace class. For example, the identity element does not have a trace, unless you want to say that its trace is infinity. By contrast, from the infinite system of qubits, we constructed an algebra A in which every element has a trace. So clearly it's an essentially new type of algebra. In fact, it's the simplest example of a type two algebra. It's said to be of type two one. It's called the type two one factor of Murray and von Neumann who constructed it in basically the same way that I described it. If A is the type two one algebra that we just constructed and B is the type one algebra of all operators on an infinite dimensional Hilbert space, we can construct a third type of algebra by simply taking their tensor product. The new algebra still has a trace since each factor does, but it's not defined for all elements because of the factor B. In fact, C is a new kind of algebra said to be of type two infinity. So it turns out that A and C are the important types of type two algebras for our applications. C is related to the black hole and A is related to the sitter space. The thermofield double of almost any non-zero Hamiltonian leads to an algebra of type three in the thermodynamic limit. So it, we have to take you now the Hamiltonian to be non-zero, but it can still be extremely simple. For example, we could take a Hamiltonian that's a sum of single qubit operators for instance, for a single qubit, we could take this Hamiltonian, and then I take H to be the sum of such single qubit operators. <clears throat> 
at inverse temperature beta, the thermal field double state now looks like this. So the ith pair of spins is entangled fully, by which I mean that the density matrix has no zero eigenvalues. It's invertible or non-degenerate, but not maximally entangled. Maximal entanglement would mean that the eigenvalues of the density matrix are all equal. Here, they differ by a factor e to the minus beta over two. So <clears throat> the ith pair of spins is fully, but not maximally entangled. We can still define a state psi TFD of n qubits by entangling each qubit pair in this state. Then we can define the function f of a as before, and it has a thermodynamic limit. The important difference is that now f, a, b, f of a, b is not equal to f of b, a, because the equality came not from a property of the operators, but from a property of the state. And again, I apologize for the notation b, which suggests that little b acts on the second system. These are two operators that act on the first system. They don't commute. So in a generic state, their expectations for a, b, and b, a would be different. We started with the only state in which the expectations were the same in either order. For any other state, even one as simple as this, f of a, b is not equal to f of b, a. For n going to infinity, we can define an algebra a naught consisting of operators that act on any finite set of qubits. And its completion is now, its completion as an algebra of observables act on, acting on this new thermal field double state is now a von Neumann algebra of type three. So this is the most elementary, perhaps, construction of a type three algebra. Oh, sorry. So this construction is due to Powers and then Iraqi and Woods in the 70s, 60s, 60s. Algebras of type two or type three don't have an irreducible representation in the Hilbert space. Whenever such an algebra acts on a Hilbert space, it always commutes with another algebra of the same type, type two or type three. For example, we constructed our type two and type three algebras as algebras that act on the A part of a bipartite system AB. So in that construction, they commute with an identical algebra that acts on system B. But that illustrates the more general fact that a type two or type three algebra acting on a Hilbert space always commutes with another similar algebra. The difference between a type two and a type three algebra is that a type two algebra has a trace and a type three algebra does not. <clears throat> so, well, that's illustrated by the construction I gave. The function f of a was a trace when the Hamiltonian was zero, in other words, for the type two case. For type three, that function was not a trace, but more generally, a type three algebra doesn't have a trace. In a type two algebra, the trace is non-degenerate in the sense that um, <clears throat> the, the, the function, the bilinear function trace AB is a non-degenerate bilinear form. That follows from the earlier result that the trace of A dagger A was positive for all non-zero A. Non-degeneracy means that if F of A is any linear function, it's equal to the trace of AB for some B in the algebra. <clears throat> now let's go back to the situation considered by Storkin. So we divide space into two regions, A and B. A is the region outside, B is the region inside. We consider some state psi of the whole universe. Now suppose it were true that the physics in region A is described by a type two algebra, curly A. Then the linear function that takes A to its expectation value in the state psi would be equal to the trace of A times row A for some row A in the algebra. As I said, non-degeneracy of the trace means that any linear function is like that for some element that I a moment ago called B, but in this context, we could call it row sub A because if the algebra were type one, we would use this condition to define the density matrix row A of state psi for measurements in region A. So 
Density matrices are usually introduced exactly to satisfy this property. A system is entangled with something else, but if you act only on a subsystem, there are some density matrix only acting for the subsystem that for which this formula holds. So introducing the density matrix lets you discuss the expectation value of any observable of a system, forgetting about all other subsystems that might exist. Anyway, this is the defining property of the density matrix of a state psi of some combined system. So since if we have the same formula for type two, it's reasonable to use the same terminology and call row A the density matrix. Also in this type two, A, type two situation. Once we have density matrices, we can define entropies as well. So in a type two algebra, you can define an entropy minus the trace of row log row. So if the region outside the horizon is described by a type two algebra, then we can define an entropy for this region. As I've already explained in ordinary quantum field theory, the algebras are type three. And that's an abstract explanation of why entropy is divergent in quantum field theory. But it turns out that when we include gravity, things are different. Gravitational effects, even for very weak coupling, convert the type three algebras into type two algebras. The mathematical mechanisms that lead to this are quite simple and not at all novel. They've long been known by operator theorists. What's new is only that these mechanisms are actually implemented by perturbative gravity in the field of a black hole or the sitter space. The details are different in the two cases and I only really have time for very brief explanations. Although I see I've gone a little bit faster than planned so I would have had a little bit more time than what I've banked on. Here I'm going to draw Professor, a Professor Biden, sorry to interrupt you. Could you please explain how the uh, how uh, algebra I used to be type three in quantum field theory? I could not quite get that. I couldn't hear what you said. Sorry. You're asking uh, why the yes. your question is why yes, the uh, theory is type three? Was that yes, yes, exactly. Yes. Uh, okay, that's actually oh, sorry, I keep I keep, okay, okay. I'll, I'll give a rough explanation. Yes, yeah, sure, please. Well, I explained that in thermodynamics, the algebra is type three. Did that satisfy you? Yes, yes. So in the infrared limit, so in, in statistical mechanics, If you take the IR limit, you get a type three algebra. Instead, in quantum field theory, the UV gives type three. Now, it, in quantum field theory, we, we might be in infinite volume, but we don't have to be. For example, take a one plus one dimensional quantum field theory. I could take the whole universe to be a circle. And then I could divide the two halves of the circle into regions A and B. So there's absolutely no infrared issue because space is a circle and regions A and B are both compact. There's no long wavelengths. There are however short wavelengths near the entangling surface. Now, um, let me remind you that, okay, I'd like to describe a state. Let's I be, sorry. let's I be the vacuum state. And I want to explain why the, why the algebra for the vacuum state is going to be type three. So what the question means is that you take the vacuum state of the whole universe, then you act on it with, okay. The vacuum state kind of determines the Hilbert space that the operators act in because the other states are all states obtained by acting with operators in region A on the vacuum state. So taking the vacuum state is a little bit like telling you what the Hilbert space is, and it's going to determine what the algebra is. It's analogous to the fact that in my discussion of thermodynamics, I defined the thermofield double state 
Well, I didn't give a complete explanation. Uh, the thermophile double state determined everything, including the algebra. So here, the uh, vacuum, let me continue, and then you can ask a question. Here, yeah. the vacuum can be defined by a path integral on a disk. Right? A path integral on a disk determines the vacuum state. And then me for measurements in the vacuum state in region A, you've got a type three algebra. Now, the claim that it's a type three is universal, but for simplicity, let me assume conformal invariance. If my conformal field theory is conformally invariant, I can map conformally the disk onto an infinite strip. I'm hope, I hope, I don't have any idea of your background, so I don't have any way to know. If I'm saying things that that are well known or things that are unfamiliar, but uh, I'm familiar with uh, conformal field theory. Good. So this picture is conformally equivalent to this one. So now region A and B are over here. Now regions A and B are not touching, so there's no ultraviolet divergence. So there, but there's an infrared divergence. So we conformally mapped the ultraviolet divergence of quantum field theory into what actually is the infrared divergence of statistical mechanics. Because this infinite strip is a way to describe the thermophile double state. If you construct a density matrix for system A from, this, from the state you get from the path integral in this strip, it'll be the thermophile double state with beta equal to twice the width of the strip. Now, these remarks may or may not be unfamiliar and there isn't time to explain them properly, but I do want to tell you that I've written a re review article with a very long title that explains all this. The title begins with, why does quantum field theory in curved space-time make sense? And then the title goes on for quite a ways. I won't write it all down. But anyway, if you want to I read- I'm for pointing out, yeah. Okay, if you want to read a fuller explanation of what, what I just said, I do recommend the review article, which is on the archive about six months ago or something. Of course, there are lots of other references. I just like my explanation, but you can look at the others. Any other questions? Thank you, Professor Rubin. Sure. I hope that was useful. So what I was going to say okay. was that um, gravity is going to convert the algebras from type three to type two. And that happens by mechanisms that operator algebraists have known for half a century. What's new is only that these mechanisms are, are actually implemented by perturbative gravity in the field of a black hole or to sitter space. So the details are different in the two cases and I'm only going to give very brief explanations. So here's a Penrose diagram for the maximally extended Schwarzschild black hole in asymptotically flat space time. So the black hole is a wormhole that connects two asymptotically flat universes, which we take to be the two systems A and B. In low energy effective field theory, we construct a Hilbert space H0 for the black hole space time. Right. It's acted on by algebras curly A and curly B of operators on the left and right. Two important operators are the ADM energies, HR and H left measured on the right or left sides. Another important operator is the bulk operator little h that generates the killing vector field of the space time, which moves time forward here on the right and moves time backwards on the left. And these operators are related by a classical formula. The killing vector field is beta times the Hamiltonian on the right, but it's minus beta times the Hamiltonian on the left. Beta is the inverse of the Hawking temperature. However, there's a subtlety in constructing the Hilbert space H0 in the case of the gravitational field. We can expand the metric around the background Schwarzschild solution. And then in the quadratic approximation, we treat H as an ordinary quantum field and construct an algebra A0 of gauge invariant observables. The basic such observable is the linearized Riemann tensor. So the contribution of gravity to the right algebra is generalized, generated by functions of the Riemann tensor. Because the algebra A0 is of type three, it seems there will be no notion of entropy. 
But the algebra A naught and the Hilbert space H naught are not large enough to describe the physics we want. One operator is missing in A naught and one mode is missing in H naught. Assuming H naught is defined to represent the modes that excite the Riemann tensor. The operator that's missing in A, A naught but is part of the physics is just the ADM energy HR. It can't be defined in terms of R mu alpha beta, so it's not part of the algebra A naught. Likewise, the mode generated by HR is not part of the Hilbert space in which the algebra acts. That mode is locally pure gauge. It's generated by a vector field V that's zero on the left boundary and agrees with D by DT on the right boundary. So there's one mode, which is just the rel relative time between the two observers. And it's totally unobservable for either observer separately, but it is a global property of the whole system. So this is a non-trivial deformation of the geometry that we can measure by an operator P and we can shift it by a conjugate operator X, but it can't be detected by the algebra A naught of observables for the right observer. So the correct Hilbert space is not the one that the type three algebra acts on. It's the, that Hilbert space tensored with a space of functions of one new variable X. On this bigger Hilbert space, HR can act. My formula says that HR does the following. It generates time translations of operators in the region on the right side for the right observer. It also shifts the new mode P that isn't detected by the linearized Riemann tensor. So what we've learned is that the difference between the ordinary gravity and quantum field theory in the field of the black hole, sorry, the difference between the ordinary quantum field theory in the field of a black hole and gravity is that we have to slightly enlarge the Hilbert space and add one more operator to the algebra. In mathematical terms, what we've discovered is that the algebra curly A is the cross product of a corresponding algebra A naught in ordinary quantum field theory by a one parameter automorphism group generated by H over beta. That automorphism group, according to famous results of these people, um, is the modular automorphism group of the hartle hawking state of the black hole. And that means, according to celebrated mathematical results from half a century ago, that the algebra A is of type two infinity, and in particular has a trace and a notion of density matrix or entropy. Concretely, since A is generated by ordinary operators together with bounded functions of one more operator, a rather general element of A can be written like this. And you find that this function behaves as a trace on the algebra. Hi, can I ask a small question? Uh, yeah. So, so A is not a factor, right? You have a, I mean, you have a central element now in the... No. Uh, Script A, a is... Yeah. Well, what would, when you ask about A, I'm not certain if you mean the final one, including the correction. Yeah, yeah. 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 It is a factor. There's no center. Or any, or sorry, if I didn't have the one by beta H, I mean, I just have the uh, X operator, right? Which was... Yeah. Uh, in, uh, in, the, in, yeah, the, yeah. in the strict large N or small G limit, you would only have the X operator. And then yeah. X would be special. But when you include gravity, X is replaced by X plus H over beta, and it's not central because H doesn't commute with the rest of the algebra. Thank you. Okay, thank this you. Is explained, this point is explained in a lot of technical detail in my paper, but because for today's talk, because uh, time is going to be a little limited, I wasn't planning to explain it in detail. Okay, thanks. Sure. So there's a natural notion of density matrix and entropy in the field of the black hole. And you can show that up to an undefined additive constant, which is independent of the state, the entropy agrees with the Bekenstein proposal. So if you like, the, the existence of this algebra gives an abstract explanation of what the fact that gravity removes the ultraviolet divergence from the entropy outside the black hole. If time allows in the discussion period, I'll give an informal explanation. <clears throat> 
Something rather similar happens in the sitter space. So here I've put together Sorry. one. Go ahead. Can I ask a question? Yeah, uh, in the, uh, you, so you explained how, um, how this works for the case of the maximally extended uh, Schwarzschild black hole, but if I had, if I had a black hole formed from collapse where I don't have two sides, uh, yeah. does, this, does this argument still go through? Uh, I believe so, but of you have to be more careful in formulating it. Um, okay. Because there, there one doesn't have a notion of um, HR minus HL, right? Which was missing when you were in the large and limit, but, but you don't have conserved quantity. You do have an algebra. Well, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the paper of Lou and Lohizer, which perhaps I should have mentioned, because I should have really said this. It's a paper by Lou and Lohizer, which was Milan Spray. Mm -hmm. I don't remember the archive number, but it was last fall, maybe 2111 as a guess. Um, uh, I think but you can make a similar argument for a one-sided black hole. You would define an algebra that would be type three, which you could define in a similar way to what they said in terms of observables to the future of some time. It would be type three in ordinary, Q of T, and I think you could argue that with gravity, it's of type two infinity. Uh, that's Wait, a very I, good question. That's a very good sorry, question. I thought I they, they also uh, only only looked at um, the eternal black hole and the thermofield double state, right? Not they only, they not only look at the eternal black hole, but if you think about it carefully, I believe the arguments can be extended to the one-sided case. But it's true that hasn't been done in the literature and it hasn't been thought through carefully as far as I know. I'm expecting though that it will turn out that you can just still define a type two infinity algebra for one time. Thank you. Okay, here's once again, the Penrose diagram of the sitter space and uh, the green region, which as I said earlier, is the call it region causally accessible to the observable observer who's on the left boundary is called a static patch. So there's a, in the sitter space, there's a killing vector field that I'll call the vector field of time translations that maps the observer world line to itself and it moves the observer forward in time. It's future time-like directed in the static patch. It's past time-like directed in the complementary patch. It goes like this. So let H be the generator of time translations. In ordinary quantum field theory, we would associate a Hilbert space curly H naught to the sitter space and a type three algebra A naught of operators in the static patch that acts on it. But in a closed universe, the isometries have to be treated as constraints. That means that we should replace A naught by what I'll call A naught super H, the, its invariant subalgebra. But that doesn't work. It turns out that A naught H is trivial. The way people who work on operator algebras describe this is that the modular automorphism group acts ergodically. But anyway, there aren't any H invariant operators in the static patch other than C numbers. To get a reasonable answer, we can include the observer in the analysis. But we can use a very minimal model of the observer. We consider a clock with a Hamiltonian that I'll call X, little x. That's the Hamiltonian of the observer. It's physically reasonable to assume the observer's energy is bounded below by zero. So I assume X is non-negative. So the effect of including the observer is to modify the Hilbert space by tensoring what we had otherwise with L2 of R plus. The algebra is likewise extended from what it was before all local quantum field operators in the static patch to A naught times the operator algebra of all operators on L2 of R plus. I'm assuming that in principle, the observer can manipulate the observer's clock in any desired fashion, which I assume means that the whole algebra of operators on L2 of R plus should be included. So the algebra of observables, including the observer, but not including the constraints, the constraint 
is A naught tensored with B of L2 of R plus. But now we have to impose the constraint and the constraint becomes the total Hamiltonian of the quantum fields plus the observer. So it's H plus the Hamiltonian of the system plus the Hamiltonian of the observer. The correct algebra of observables taking account of the presence of the observer is therefore the H hat invariant part of the extended algebra. Well, essentially by what's called Takasaki duality, the H hat invariant part of the extended algebra is of type 2-1, which means there's a notion of density matrix and entropy. And because the algebra is now of type 2-1 instead of type 2 infinity, there's a state of maximum entropy. Oh, sorry, uh, can I ask a question? Yes, uh, did, uh, The way you've defined the total Hamiltonian now, uh, doesn't it uh, fail to be continuous? Uh, isn't that a I mean, fail to be discrete, isn't that, isn't that an issue? Um, it's an issue which uh, pragmatically, um, it's an issue which I can't address properly. So um, <clears throat> if you took the clock to have levels that are spaced as finely as G Newton or smaller, the discussion would still work. It doesn't have to literally be continuous. But still, I don't feel I understand in a satisfactory way to answer your question. The question, the question is saying the following, it would be more physically sensible. A, a real clock would have a discrete spectrum. A continuous spectrum, which implies infinitely many states of bounded energy is a little unphysical. And um, um, I think the reason we got a sensible answer here is because we're taking the limit, we're computing in the limit that G goes to zero. If G were not zero, it would be important to give the observer a more realistic clock with a discrete spectrum. But pragmatically, it works nicely, the model the way I've said it. But I don't feel I understand the really satisfactory answer to the question. Is there another question? Okay. If you're not trying to answer, ask a question, then please mute yourself. There's a question in the chat. Uh... Does the continuum spectrum of the X pose a problem? That's the question that we just asked, which I just discussed. So the answer is it poses no problem in this computation that I do, but I don't feel I understand it deeply. So remember when we constructed the type 2-1 algebra, we did it by taking the Hamiltonian to be zero. So the thermo field double state was maximally entangled. It had the maximum possible entropy. So in a type 2-1 algebra, there's a state of maximum possible entropy. That's not true for a black hole. See, a type 2 infinity algebra, there's no upper bound on the entropy, but for type 1, there is. The black hole entropy is unbounded above because the black hole mass can always be increased, increasing the entropy. But for the sitter space, it's believed that the bunch Davies state, sometimes called, is the state of maximum entropy. And algebraically, that corresponds to the fact that the algebra of the sitter space is of type 2 1 and has a state of maximum entropy. Hi, sorry, can I ask a question? So, in the previous black hole case, why was this spectrum uh, not an issue that uh, was raised in the initial case? I mean, the ADM mass of the black hole can vary continuously, right? Or maybe I misunderstood. The, the, the... Well, that's actually also a good point. From the point of view of, of low energy quantum field theory, the ADMS takes continuous values. Yes. We believe in some sense in an exact treatment, the energy levels of the black hole are discrete, but okay. the discrete is exponentially fine for small g. And I was really only computing for small in the small g limit. Okay, thanks. For small okay. g limit, it looks continuous and treating it as being continuous is adequate for today's purposes. Mm -hmm. But you're both asking excellent questions, which, well, my guess is the question about the sitter is more accessible. But anyway, they're both excellent questions that fully answering probably requires a deeper understanding. So, sorry, just, just one more question. So, so in the previous case, if you are below Hawking page, then you still have the trivial non-cross product where you have a center and uh, have a type three. That's, that's the... well, well. I'm not sure whether you have in mind the anti sitter space. The way I presented the lecture today was for asymptotically flat space. Ah. If, in anti sitter space, if you're below the Hawking page, 
yeah, 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 that's what I had in mind. Then the algebra would be type one. Yeah, right. right. So, um, you see, in a type, okay, in type two one, the trace of the identity is one. In type two infinity, the trace of the identity is infinity. So the identity for a type two one algebra is the density. Since say for type two one, you can set row equals one, but you can't do that for type two infinity because a density matrix is supposed to have trace one. So for type two one, because the trace of the identity converges, there is a state of maximum entropy, which is, well, in De Sitter space, the state of maximum entropy is believed to be the bunch baby state. But in the algebraic construction I'm telling you about, because the algebra is of type two one, there's a maximum entropy state corresponding to the case that the density matrix is one. And that maximum entropy state has the right properties to be the bunch Davy state. Because the density matrix is one, in the language used by Dong, Dong Silverstein and Taroba, there's a flat entanglement spectrum. So they computed from the Euclidean path integral that the density matrix of Euclidean of the Sitter space has a flat entanglement spectrum. And now I'm telling you that in the type two one algebra that we get, that makes perfect sense. And again, facts known from gravity can be recovered from the algebra. I should stress something I haven't had time to explain. Entropy defined this way is really defined up to an overall additive constant independent of the state. So what we've defined is kind of a renormalized entropy. It's analogous to entropy in classical physics. In classical physics, entropy satisfies um, <clears throat> this nice first law, which defines the entropy up to an additive constant. And in classical physics, there's no way to, to fix the additive constant. The story I've explained with type two algebras is similar. In that story, entropy is defined up to an additive constant. In classical physics, you, there's no way to fix the constant and the same is true in the context of the type two algebras. To conclude, we've learned that at the level of semi-classical gravity, one can define an algebra A such that the generalized entropy of a black hole or cosmological horizon is the entropy of a state of the algebra. And thank you very much for your attention. Uh, let us thank Professor Witten for the wonderful talk. Yes, uh, so uh, do you have some time for questions? Yes, sure. Yeah, uh, please go ahead so, with any so, questions. Hi, hi, so I had one more question. So if the entropy that you get from type, uh, from the type two uh, algebra, is it uh, swap entropy? Because this is the asymptotically flat case, right? So I thought that the one human entropy had this IR divergence. So. Oh, that's, you're right. In the asymptotically flat case, we have, Uh, I, it's, it's true that I've ignored in my presentation the fact that if the black hole is in thermal equilibrium, mm -hmm. then in asymptotically flat space, there will be an IR divergence in the entropy. Yes. In higher orders. But, um, uh, well, well, what's more important, I think, it's not just that there's an IR divergence in the entropy, there's an IR divergence in the thermal ensemble. So, mm -hmm. Uh, in asymptotically flat space, the thermal ensemble will really collapse because it has a constant energy density, entropy density everywhere. Yes. Just in terms of the algebra, if if the ensemble made sense and you really had a type two al algebra, it would be defining an renormalized entropy, and okay. it would remove okay. into the divergence. The problem is really that the ensemble doesn't doesn't make sense. Um, so we do need some kind of IR di cutoff. Uh, but is it possible that if the if the entropy came out to be well defined, it could be the swap entropy that Mar, you know Maros and Max were advocating in their in their paper? Uh, or well, is there is there renormalized entropy? Could it be the swap entropy, some sort of swap entropy? Well, uh, you're saying swap entropy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
uh, well, uh, swap entropy sounds like it refers to Rainy entropies, right? Right, so right, right. We can, do, we can define entropy and Rainy entropies here because um, trace row to the K makes sense. So Rainy entropies are well-defined. We could dif discuss them instead of von Neumann entropies. Mm -hmm. Um, one difference from their discussion, though, is that with the algebra, there's an undefined additive constant. Right. And if you look it out, you'll see that there, it's also an undefined additive constant in the swap entropy. So I see. we would be defining the swap entropy, but we would be missing a constant. Okay, thank you. Uh, you see, okay. okay. So, this formula doesn't have an undefined additive constant, at least not, it doesn't mm -hmm. explain your renormalization procedure. But it has the drawback that there isn't really a well understood sense in which it is an entropy. It's what you compute from the gravitational path integral. Mm -hmm. But in a situation where the gravitational path integral doesn't have a Hilbert space interpretation. So this thing is, it has no ill defined constant. Well, it has no ill defined constant. Uh, for a given renormalization procedure. Yes. But it's not really an entropy in a known way. Uh, instead, in my lecture, lines trace log row, row log row is an entropy, but it has an arbitrary constant. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Any other questions? Sorry, I have a question. Hello. Uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, I, I was uh, I just wanted to know. Uh, um, you told us how the Hilbert space uh, that you get from naive, from taking uh, the uh, the gravitational field to be g naught plus h needs to be extended and and you need to include a new mode uh, uh, also. Yeah. So doesn't yeah. that change the formula for the generalized entropy? Uh, uh, that people have written down, that you that you, that you, that you've also written down. The doesn't that make a, a doesn't that change the formula because now now one starts with a different Hilbert space. Well, I'm not 100 satisfied with my explanation. Uh, first of all, I'd like to review it. I, I, I'm not that satisfied with the way I explained it. So there's a Hilbert space that you get from small fluctuations. Then there are two more modes. So the two more modes are um, the black hole mass and there's a relative time shift between the two observables. The relative time shift uh, is not measurable by an observer on either side because it's the difference between the two. You need to look globally at the whole space time to see it. Right. Since there are two more modes, there are two more operators. And those are the ADM Hamiltonians. So um, in addition to the Hilbert space of these small fluctuations, there are two more modes, the black hole mass and the time shift. And there are the two more operators, HR and HL. In the classical limit, or let's say for the pure black hole, HR and HL are just the same, but they differ by quantum corrections. Um, mm -hmm. Well, it, I th I'm not sure I understand your question, but your question might be, would someone doing a one-loop calculation find a way to include M and delta T in the definition of S out? Okay. I'm, not sure I'm not sure the answer is no, but you'd have trouble making sense of it because M does have a continuous spectrum. So you're at risk of deciding the contribution is infinite if it's not zero. Right, right. Uh, I, I was just wondering if, if um, the way we compute generalized entropy, this fact, the, the fact that you've told us that there are some modes that we didn't, uh, that weren't in the Hilbert space to begin with, in the semi-classical Hilbert space to begin with, uh, doesn't that, uh, uh, um, yeah, I just wanted to know if that, if if one has to redo that computation in in in, in this en enlarged Hilbert space, well, I'm not sure. I, I don't think I can answer either yes or no to that question. Uh, 
one can try. Um, the algebra tells us, okay. okay. The, the, the computation that's usually done gives a divergent answer. Right. Okay. I don't want to answer either, either yes or no to that question. I don't know what would be eliminating. Including this extra mode, these extra modes and these operate. So the observer on one side only includes, has one of these two operators, H right. So we add one operator to the discussion and we act, we act on two modes, but when we quantize them, we just get L2 of R. Um, I don't understand much more than I've said, which is that when you include the, this extra little bit, you can define an extended algebra where entropy is a well-defined concept. Uh, weather can be interpreted by somehow redoing the uh, doing in a slightly more careful way the usual computation of entropy entanglement entropy i don't know uh, i think i should not come with a yes or no answer to the question okay thank you thank you sure okay, yeah i have a question uh, so in string theory the first term is finite right because g newton has a finite normalization so yeah. does that mean that your uh, procedure of defining the quantum entropy gives a way to the ultraviolet regularize the second term, the no. S out? I feel morally SL should be finite in string theory. I don't know how to do a calculation that exhibits that. My own attempt to do that a few years ago was a failure, I would say. But the procedure you suggested doesn't take, tell you how to calculate S out by just by subtracting the first term? Well, uh, I'm not sure what you're assuming is known. The discussion of the type two algebra might not, might not be very natural in string theory. Uh, I don't think, do you feel we know a natural way to try to compute S out in string theory? Yeah, no, I don't know, but uh, uh, I mean, since you define the trace roll of row and we know the first term. Yes. I mean, can't one say that S out is just the difference between the two? Well, I define trace row log row from the perspective of low energy field theory, including a small gravitational correction. I don't really know a stringy version of the definition. Uh, I, I have heard interesting thoughts from Aaron Wall and a postdoc of his, his name is escaping me at the moment, um, about trying to do a stringy computation of S out. I feel if you understood how to do a stringy calculation of S out, it would be finite. And Soskin and Uglum actually said some fascinating qualitative things about it. What they said was that um, if here's the horizon, see, okay, the classical action is just local. There's no way to split it in terms of a piece inside and a piece outside, or, or you could split it additively, but the action density comes at a point. You can't split the point. But the stringy analog, you do a path integral for a genus zero surface. So what, where the classical action comes from in string theory is the genus zero part of the path integral. And then a genus zero world sheet can be partly inside and partly outside the horizon. So, Susskind and Eichelm said that the area term should come from the outside part of the genus zero path integral. The only trouble is it was a it was a fascinating idea, but then they went on to do other things that didn't work on it, and no one has made any progress with the idea. But I would think that if we could compute S out in string theory, it would be finite. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Uh, there are a final couple of questions in the chat. Um, if one were to compute the modular entropy using the Lange entropy, you need to find the extreme RT surface from ADS space. What does this translate to into Sitter space? I think the logic, uh, well, uh, I'm going to give an unhelpful answer, which is I agree with the question. I think the logic of the Euclidean calculations 
is less clear in the sitter space than it is in Euclidean space. This, sorry, than it is for the black hole. So for the black hole, there's a fairly clear derivation of the RT surface, the prescription for the entropy, and all kinds of things that go with it. For the sitter space, why the horizon area should be interpreted as an entropy is not terribly clear to me. And so it's true, as I said, that Dong, Taroba, and Silverstein did a Euclidean calculation and claimed that the density matrix of the sitter space was flat. And that agrees with considerations by Susskind and others. And also it agrees with the picture that comes from the type 2 1 algebra I've talked about. So it's apparently correct. But the logic about behind the calculation looks a little bit murky to me, even though it seems to give good answers. So therefore, I don't think I can answer you well. Somebody asks, why is S out the entanglement entropy? Well, why, if the question is, why is not A over 4G the entanglement entropy? Well, A over 4G is just defined by a classical formula. It doesn't have any quantum interpretation that is known. Maybe one, Sorkin's idea was that A over 4G is really entanglement entropy of the ultraviolet modes, but we don't know how to do a calculation that would show that. Ashok's question was kind of getting at that. As for why S out is the entanglement entropy, while well, starting with Susskind and Uglum, it was discovered that if you interpret S out as entanglement entropy, you get better results that you don't get otherwise. The only one I had time for to say was the most basic, which is that if we interpret S out as entanglement entropy, then the um, ultraviolet divergences cancel. But many other things were discovered later. Uh, if there aren't any other questions, or are there other questions? I uh, can I ask one question. The, yes. um, in uh, you, you explained that in the uh, at least in the ADS case, in the large n limit, um, one, one has uh, even in the flat space case, one has a type three algebra, and then uh, uh, when you include one over n corrections, it becomes a type two. Yes. Uh, 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 and um, I wanted to ask if um, if in the if in the exact uh, if in the if, if at finite n you you expected uh, you expected to be a type one algebra. Um, if you're asking about anti sitter space, then definitely yeah. for finite n we just have an ordinary Hilbert space, and there should be a type one algebra acting on it. But so, I do so want one, sorry sorry. I, I do want you can get back to your question in a second, but I do want to make one comment which is that if you want to be able to say in a precise fashion that the states are black holes, I'm not sure that's true for finite n. I think it might be that to have the states be in a precise fashion black holes, you need a notion of causality, classical causality. And we have that, I think, order of order and one over n, but possibly not in the exact theory. So I think there's a kind of duality that if you want quantum microstates and to the finite, and if you want to be able to, in a precise fashion, say you're talking about a black hole, then you have to be doing an asymptotic expansion near n equals infinity. I'm not sure about that, but I think that's a possibility. Go ahead with it, this next uh, question. I, uh, yeah, I, I didn't quite understand uh, why you said that you lose causality, you lose a notion of causality if you try to, if you try to uh, get well, a type one algebra. Space, well, what I said was that if you have fun at n, you don't have space time in a precise way. Space time oh, okay. in the large n. But mm -hmm. so n equals four super young Mills theory in large n limit or asymptotically near the large n limit has a space time interpretation. But if you said n equals 17, I'm not convinced there's a precise space time interpretation. So you can study a state that's above the Hawking page transition. But if you want to, um, in a precise way, say that that state is a black hole, I think that won't work for n equals 17. And although I don't think this is a large part of the answer to the questions about black holes, I think a small part of it probably is that it's difficult to simultaneously have black hole microstates and to precisely be talking about black holes. Right, right. Uh, so so uh, my question was going from type three to type Two um, was uh, that you didn't have in, in in the type three case you didn't have the 
the little h operator, which is hr minus hs. But when you included that, you you uh, you got a type two algebra. Uh, but but I guess the you in, uh, you still include it in uh, you don't you don't have um, uh, exponential of h, right? You only have uh, you only have h and, and and finite powers of h. Is that is that right for the type two algebra? Which h are we talking about? Uh, the little h. Uh, well, what we have is really little h plus x. And then we have bounded functions of little h plus x. Well, a type 2 algebra by definition only have bounded operators. So you take bounded functions of h plus x. The reason for taking bounded operators is that they form an algebra. Um, unbounded operators can't be multiplied. So. OK. OK. So, so then, so then I. Uh, um... Uh, then what are the operators still still missing, so to say, at at um, a, uh, you know going from going from this uh, any order in one over n expansion to finite n? There must be some operators that are missing, which are not which which is why you're not getting a type one algebra, right? Uh, is that is that correct? Well, there are algebra, there are operators missing, but there also are relations among operators. So. Um, uh, so for finite n, you have baryon operators or operators similar to baryons. Um, okay. Uh, but I think it might be more important that some operators vanish um, for any finite n. Um, you see, okay, suppose you look at the list of single trace operators. You can take single trace operators, trace of phi to the little n for any n. But for any finite n, that gets truncated. They're not all independent of each other. The higher ones are polynomials and the lower ones. I think that's the, probably the most important difference between finite n and, and the one of n expansion. Any other questions? Thank you. There is one in the chat. Uh from earlier, it seems like the additive constant was fixed to be the horizon area by G in the case of black hole. How does this happen? Well, the, the, the description by the algebras doesn't, in a satisfactory way, fix an overall additive constant. So um, if you like back in the Euclidean path integral fixes the additive constant, but doesn't have an interpretation in terms of MPP, not a known interpretation. Instead, the with the algebras, we're, we are talking about entropies, but we don't know how to fix the additive constant. And uh, can we make further deformations to the de Sitter algebra to make it into a type one algebra? Um, well, not in a way that I can tell you. Okay. Yeah, uh, I think that's all the questions. Okay, maybe it's time to call today then. Thank you yeah. very much for the invitation then for your- Thank, thank you so time. much, yeah, for, for accepting it and answering all the questions. Sure thing. Be well, everybody. Stay safe.